Uh, so welcome back to our lecture, lecture number 10 actually, uh, where we are going to discuss um, control for value-based uh, methods with function approximation. So basically what we introduced last week with respect to um, deep reinforcement learning when it comes to predictions. So we have a fixed policy and we want to evaluate how good or how bad this policy is by estimating the state value is going to be extended today into the context of value-based control. So we utilize what we have learned from last week. So we try to estimate state values, so to be precise state action values, and then utilize this information to also pick actions and try to improve our policy over time. Therefore, a little preface. Um, what we still are going to um, assume for today is basically that we have still continuous states, which motivates you, the usage of function approximation, for example, in terms of artificial neural networks, but we are using discrete action spaces, or we are assuming discrete action spaces. This is very important, such that we are able to actually utilize value-based um, control methods, right? So if we have uh, a state action value that basically indicates how good or how bad it is to do a certain decision, right? And if we have a discrete number of decisions, let's say like five decisions, then we can just compare these five different discrete decisions against each other by the state action values and take this decision, which just gives us the biggest state action value. So that's then basically when we learn the skew values, it's basically afterwards just a simple comparison. So that's why we assume that and we will extend the scheme starting from next week then to also continuous action spaces. Um, yeah, so basically what we're going to do uh, first is that what we have learned last week in terms of state value estimation, uh, that we will just transfer everything um, what we introduced there to the state action values, right? So we have done this with uh, Monte Carlo, TD0, TD Lambda, uh, with linear function approximation in terms of least squares, temporal difference learning to the state values, and today we're going to extend that also to the action values because we need the action values in order to make decisions. And then eventually, by using the generalized policy iteration scheme, today we also try not to just do prediction on the action values, but also try to find optimal policies so by improving ourselves over time. One question I would like to discuss also in terms of the preface is how we actually can implement this function approximator here in terms of practical means. So what do we have here? So we have an estimate of the state action value, so how good or how bad it is to make a certain decision in a certain state x, and we approximate this function using the parameter weights w, right? So the question is how do we map this function in terms of implementing something. And classically, as already mentioned today and last week, we do this by artificial neural networks. And as we have a discrete action space, or we assume this discrete action space, we can basically implement this in different variants. Here on the left-hand side, we see the, let's say, trivial implementation, I would call it. Uh, we have an artificial neural network which outputs the state action value, giving a certain state, and as an input argument, we formulate the action u. The problem here is, or so, of course you can implement it in this way, it's, it's not a big deal, but the practical problem here is that this action u, as I've said, or as we assume, is a discrete number or a discrete information, right? So, and many decisions can be quite like opposite. They can be like very different, right? So if I go left or if I go right, these are completely different decisions. And in order to be able, in terms of a numerical implementation, that this artificial neural network is able to really uh, process these discrete informations, these potentially also um, informations which are somehow opposite to each other, uh, normally, this will then lead to more complex structures in terms of the artificial neural network topology, meaning that 
things will get more complicated, we have more computational burden, and so on. So therefore, uh, what we can also do is, we can uh, do a variant of this implementation, this middle one, uh, where we do a multi-output architecture. So we basically just provide to the artificial neural network the state information X, so what is the state of our environment, and we perform a multi-output architecture where we have as many outputs in this Q value approximator as we have decision options. So in a, my little example where I said we have five decision options, we would have five Q value estimates here at the output, and this has the, um, the nice improvement or the nice advantage that I do not have a discrete decision uh, variable here at the input of the artificial neural network, and that by just inferring this neural network once, I directly get estimates for all my five decisions, and then I can just compare these Q values with each other and take the decision which maximizes it. As a variant, if maybe my decision space is very complex, I could also split this up here in different subnetworks so that for every decision I might integrate something like a subnetwork, maybe on top of a base layer network, which is not really depicted here in the figure, but this would be basically a variant of this middle part. Basically, um, the motivation here is the same. Let's try to go with this multi-output architecture in order to implement things more efficiently. However, of course, you will also make uh, use of these topologies and discuss them more in details than in the um, exercise accordingly. In terms of function approximation and feature engineering, uh, we still assume that also for the action values, we do some feature engineering, which we have introduced last week, so some potentially nonlinear preprocessing of data uh, in order to enrich our information which we receive from um, the environment. And F is here again our feature engineering function. The only difference now uh, today, in terms of last week, is that this feature engineering now becomes dependent not only on the state, but also on the action, right? So state and action is required to calculate the state action value, and therefore that's a trivial uh, extension. However, in terms of nomenclature, because I do not want to write out this feature engineering function here all the time, I will just write still q hat being a function of s, uh, x, u, and w, and we just implicitly assume that there is in this Q function approximator, potentially some feature engineering, uh, which we will not uh, mention so far um, here in the, in the lecture. But of course, you will see then later on in the exercises that feature engineering definitely can help in order to speed up the learning process. Okay, so that was a little preface, basically, again, in terms of assumptions, some implementation details, and so on. And now I would like to basically uh, present to you what we are going to discuss today. Uh, we are going to basically discuss the straightforward extension from our um, on-policy prediction methods from last week to on-policy control with semi-gradient methods. Then, what we have also discussed last week in terms of least squares TD, LSTD as a prediction method, is going to be extended today to a policy iteration method, so to a learning method on how to make optimal decisions, assuming that we use a linear function approximators, so that's why it's these squares, and so these two would be like straightforward transfers from last week, so to speak, and then what we're going to discuss at the end of today's lectures is um, actually like conceptually, of course, a neighboring concept, but there are also many tricks and new ideas involved into the so-called deep Q networks, which have been uh, conceptually one of the earlier methods around the year 2015-14, which really uh, boosted the trend of reinforcement learning in many applications, because this was this algorithm class, the DQN algorithm class, was one of the big um, breakthroughs applied to um, games, in particular Atari games, published in this years by DeepMind, so the Google um, 
lab on reinforcement learning. Okay, however, let's start first with the things which we just need to transfer from last week, and that is basically the on policy control with semi gradient. In order to do so, we just need first again to define our cost function just for formal um, reasons. The cost function now uh, looks, of course, very similar to last week. We assume on policy control. So that's why we do not need any weighting here in this uh, quadratic cost function, because we assume that the data which we feed to this cost function basically just comes from an on policy distribution, and this, that this on policy distribution is um, a good yeah, representation of the problem. Difference now is that we basically learn the Q values and not the V values anymore. In order to do um, the same thing what we have done last week, we apply the semi-gradient approach. So basically, we update the parameters of the Q value approximator by a simple gradient descent step or semi-gradient descent step. That's why we basically assume that we calculate the gradient here of this right-hand side of this equation only with respect to the Q part here on the right-hand side and basically neglect that this target, which is here still written as a, let's say, general target, that the gradient of this target value here is not required. So that was the same gradient approach. How can we actually implement that? Of course, we need to exchange this target by data, by values, which we can actually calculate, right? Because nobody will tell us what the actual Q value will look like. We need to learn this from, from data, which just incorporates state information, action information, and rewards, potentially a discounting factor. So therefore, we need to exchange that. The most simplest case is, again, the Monte Carlo approach. So we assume that we have full episodes, and based on the full episodes, we sample the returns, and then set a return sample as a proxy for the target. Or we do Zarza, in the control context, so that would be the temporal difference approach, or TD0. So we take our target and approximate it by the first order uh, yeah, Bellman approach, so reward plus discounted Q value of the successor state, assuming some, some successor action. Or we can also do this with n step SASA, so that we sample n rewards from the environment and then do the bootstrapping after the nth uh, sample. So in this way, we can basically exchange this target here by many means. Alternatives here would be also um, TD Lambda, so the eligibility trace approach, which we introduced uh, later in our lecture, um, back or later back in our lecture series, but that is here not mentioned. Okay, uh, from that, I think it becomes already clear, I hope, at least it becomes already clear, that um, at this point we can really just transfer everything which we have seen from last week in order to predict the Q values of the state and action space, right? And if we have the Q value, so if somebody would give you, giving some problem, giving some application, this Q value function, in a discrete action space, our problem would be actually solved, right? So if we have the state action values, that basically indicates for a given state how good or how bad the certain actions are, and from this information I can pick optimal action, right? So if we would have this information or a very good approximation of that, then our control, our decision-making task is fully solved because we have a full description of what are the best optimal actions. So the question is um, how we will get this Q value estimate or how we can utilize data along the way in order to find out what are optimal actions because actually nobody will give you this information, right? And this will lead us to a problem I would like to discuss with you. And the problem is that in the tabular methods, right, where we had discrete states and discrete actions, so where everything was separated from each other, we had this policy improvement theorem, right? 
And this policy improvement theorem basically gave us a very nice guarantee because it said to us, because we had this tabular information, so all states and all action combinations were completely separated from each other, that for each state action combination, I can learn independently state action value. And if I learn it for, for one element of this table, all the other elements of the table are not influenced. And this policy improvement theorem basically then gave us a guarantee that we are able to learn all state action values ac accur accurately and that we will also able to find optimal decision-making policy. The problem now in deep reinforcement learning where we use function approximation is basically that we have this generalization problem which I've already mentioned last week. So we cannot learn the state action values anymore independently for certain parts of the state action space because we have a function approximator, like an artificial neural network, which basically spans this entire problem space. So if I take a little data snippet, which is sampled in this part of the state action space, it will also influence the form of the parameter set and of the function approximator at other parts of the state action space because I have a function, an artificial neural network or a linear function or whatsoever, which combines different parts of our problem space. In tabular methods, these parts of the problem space are completely disconnected because all information is in independent table cells. And if we have function approximators, they are linked to each other. So that was this generalization problem. And this generalization problem in terms of learning optimal decisions means that if I try to improve my policy in a certain part of the state action space, that this will have impact on other parts of the state action spaces and of my, of my policies I learn. And therefore what can happen is that in certain parts I will improve my policy, I will improve my decision making, and in other parts this will lead or can lead, not will lead, but can lead, to negative impacts. So I improve somewhere and decrease my performance in terms of decision making in other parts of the problem space. And that basically means that the policy improvement theorem, which we have discussed in tabular methods, does not apply in any deep reinforcement learning problem. So that means at that point of time, where you use function approximators by artificial neural networks, linear function approximators, or any kind of function, non-tabular approach, that you do not have any guarantee anymore that you will be able to find optimal policies. So by design, it can happen that you will only find suboptimal policies and potentially the deviance, the difference between optimal policy making and the policy which you can learn using a function approximator can even be quite big. And therefore we conceptually actually have a big problem, right? So actually we want to find optimal policies in the entire problem space, but we do not have any guarantees anymore that we are able to do so. So what does that basically mean in terms of practices? We need to know this problem, of course, first. And we need to take into account um, what that means for testing and validating reinforcement learning methods. That means that if you have learned a policy for a reinforcement learning problem, you should definitely take care of testing this policy to ensure that the policy in the problem space or the subpart of the problem space, which you are really taking care of, that this fulfills your requirements. So this basically motivates empirical testing. Right? So if you are interested in finding the quickest route here from the university campus to the city center and you obtain data in order to find the best route in order to go from here to the city center, uh, over time you might have the optimal policy for that. But that can then lead that you basically forget, in simplified words, other routes which you have already learned in the past, because your function approximator is only able to hold a specific amount of information, right? 
So if you have already learned how to get from the campus uh, optimally to um, DAL or to uh, whatsoever, Salzkotten or whatsoever, maybe you forget this information uh, while you try to find the best route into the city center. Okay. So this is really a fundamental problem, um, which uh, is the biggest difference in my, from my personal perspective between the tabular methods, which we have learned during the introduction of the course, and the deep learning methods, which we are enrolling um, from starting from last week. Okay. However, um, we are not pessimistic, so we know about the problem. Uh, we should keep that in mind. As I said, it's motivating, from my personal perspective, empirical testing of policies. But um, we can still utilize the methods which we introduce in the following and try to make the best out of it. And let's do that. So based on this simple transfer from Monte Carlo prediction, semi-gradient prediction, to Monte Carlo control uh, from last week to today, we basically find that the algorithm, the pseudocode, which is summarized here, is basically the same as from last week, just with one or two little difference. The first little difference is here on this line that uh, we might follow a given policy pi, which we would do for prediction of the Q values, or, that's now the difference, we can do epsilon greedy searches, right? So if you have a Q value function, which basically tells you during the learning process, I think this action is best, let's take it. We just use epsilon greedy, so with a certain probability, we do not take the action from which we think it might be the best one in the current state of our learning process, but we just take another action for sake of exploration, right? And if you do explore sufficiently well over time, this can then lead to more information, new alternatives are being evaluated, and we can actually learn by this epsilon greedy concept, which we just directly uh, apply here from the tabular methods to the deep learning methods um, to find better actions than before. Second difference, of course, is that now the parameter set, which we update here via the semi-gradient approach, does lead to state action values and not any more the state values from last week. However, except for this, Two little changes. This is basically more or less the same um, algorithm like the every visit gradient Monte Carlo based estimation scheme from last week, which we can now also utilize for control by plugging in the epsilon greedy exploration method. Likewise, um, we can do the same for the um, temporal difference learning derived approaches like Zaza. In this case, we do not do it in an episodic way, but we do it in a step-by-step -step way, and we approximate basically here our uh, target by a simple uh, first-order approach, so by the TD0 approach, in order to learn also in a step-like fashion. Also here, we can then implement the epsilon greedy approach, of course, if you are not only interested in predicting the Q values of this policy, but also by improving our Q values over time. Okay, so what is the takeaway message? Takeaway message is that state value prediction can be transferred directly to action value prediction. Combining this with this generalized policy scheme as our general learning scheme in reinforcement learning will bring you control based, value based reinforcement learning methods, and we know that these methods can lead to only approximative suboptimal policies because we have lost the guarantees of the policy improvement theory. Okay, but as I said, we are still optimistic, and I would like to give you a small example that this actually works, uh, a very classical example, the so-called mountain car example, which is basically a simplified application example of the inverted pendulum. Uh, in this case, we do not want to stabilize something, but we want to flee with this car from this valley onto the top. 
So typically the car is somehow initialized here in this valet and your task is to reach the top here on the right hand side. However, in this task the car is underpowered, so that means starting here in the valley at zero speed, the acceleration capabilities of this car are not sufficient to directly drive up the hill, but you basically need to swing up, gain momentum, and then you are able eventually to flee out of this valley, which is basically something like the inverted pendulum for those which are familiar with this classical control example without the stabilization phase. Um, classically, uh, we can define this as in, in different problem spaces. Here in this problem space, we assume two continuous states. That is the position in this valley and the velocity of the car. And we have a discrete action set with three different discrete actions, which might be a certain constant force of acceleration to the left-hand side, a certain force of acceleration to the right-hand side, or no acceleration at all. So therefore, we would learn a function approximator with three outputs, right? Each output of this Q value would basically set if my car is in a certain position, somewhere here, and has a certain velocity, which action, so accelerating to the left, accelerating to the right, or do not accelerate at all, is optimal, right? So three Q values are being learned in parallel. The reward is very simple, it's just a minus one. So what does that mean is basically the longer you are in this environment, so the longer you are not able to reach the top of the hill to get penalties, right? Which you do not want. So basically this indicates that the agent you learn should uh, learn how to get out of the hill as quick as possible. Right. Then with Zaza, so with our TD-based uh, Q-value approach, we can learn over time how to flee out of uh, this valley. And what we have basically shown here uh, from the book of Sutton and Bartow are the so-called cost-to-go values. So what means cost-to-go? That basically means if you are in a certain position and having a certain velocity, what is the maximum possible Q value you get out of that? And the maximum possible Q value here with a negative sign in front basically means how many steps do you need in order to flee out of the valley, right? So the higher these values, the worse is basically your situation because here, let's say, after 9,000 episodes when the learning process has basically ended, that means if you have zero or near zero uh, position and zero velocity, that would basically mean that you need 120 time steps in order to flee out of the valley. If you are, let's say here, so you have a high velocity, so you already have gained a lot of momentum, and the position is close to this goal position here, then you only have, you know, five, ten or something time steps until your car actually have reached the goal. So that's why the cost to go function, so basically our cost function, is smaller here, indicating that this would be better. What do we see from this um, diagram is basically two information. The one information is that this Q value estimate at the very beginning is just initialized to zeros, right? So we see that here over the nearly the entire position space, nearly the entire velocity space, the Q values, or the negative Q values to be more precise, are basically just zero or close to zero. So we have initialized the agent arbitrarily around zero. So that basically means at the beginning, the agent doesn't have any clue about the true Q values in the environment. Then over time, we see with the increasing number of learning episodes, how these cost to go values increase. So how the negative Q values increase, basically indicating that using Zarza, the agent gets more information and is able to predict in terms of the Q values, uh, how long it takes to flee out of the valley in certain situations uh, with this scheme here on the right being the final learning outcome. 
What do we not see in this picture here is actually how the Q values of the three actions look like. So what we see here is basically always the, the max um, Q value, so basically the Q value of the best possible action. What we could do, actually it's not written in the lecture book unfortunately, but what we could actually visualize here is um, the Q values of all three actions, right? So that we basically have three times this diagram indicating that in certain situations the action of accelerating to the left, accelerating to the right, or do not accelerate at all can have different Q values, right? So for example, if your car has a high speed towards the goal state and is close to the goal state in terms of the position, we would of course expect that the Q value of accelerating into this direction, into the right direction, is much higher than the Q value associated with the action of accelerating into the opposite direction, right? So basically, what we would have then are three of these maps, and based on three of these maps, we could make decisions. Um, another point which I would like to briefly mention is that in this case, what have been used here is linear approximation under the hood. So no artificial neural network, but linear approximation. And the question is, how can this actually work? Uh, because we have actually, if I go back one step, we actually have a nonlinear environment, so to speak, in that sense that the, the forces, the gravity, and so on in this valley kind of approach here have nonlinear dynamics. And if we are using a linear function approximator, normally we are not able to represent such complex cost functions because, you know, that's a two-dimensional space. And if you have a linear function in a two-dimensional space, that basically means you have something like a plane, right? Uh, how does it come that we do have a, such a complex structure? And the answer to that is that in this example from the lecture book, what have been used is a very special uh, feature engineering technique. And this feature engineering technique is called tile coding. What is tile coding? Uh, it's quite straightforward from my point of perspective. So what you actually do is you have a problem space, which is here approximated or abstracted by a two-dimensional state space. And what you do is you add up so-called tilings, so basically shifted grid coordinates of this problem space. These are these four different colored grid spaces. And what you do is basically you have something like an activation function. So if you are in this state, what is going to happen is that in these tilings, certain subparts, discretized subparts of these tilings basically will be activated. So for example, these four tilings here will be uh, tiles will be activated. And what you basically do by this is you have something like discrete coordinates, and that is some kind of nonlinear feature engineering which allows you to have significantly different values for this part in comparison to this part because the feature space of these two points is completely different due to the tiles which have been activated here and here. What I think can, comes also clear out of this is that if you have many tiles or tilings uh, in the feature engineering space that you will basically blow up your state space um, for the sake of having more information ready. And that can be, of course, and also problematic in that sense that you might need more computational power. However, tile coding is more or less not used anymore today because normally what you would do directly is that you approximate this not with a linear function approximator but with a nonlinear artificial neural network where the feature engineering is not so important. I just wanted to mention that for the sake of yeah, completeness that you know how uh, basically this map, these Q function maps have been designed. As the last information for the sub section, uh, also just some pseudocode uh, for your convenience for home basically. Um, the end step semi gradients are just as the extension to the uh, one step um, Zaza method. But yeah, basically the same transfer as previously, nothing new here. 
Okay. So what have we learned? We have learned that we have been able to transfer state values to action values and using epsilon greedy policy search, we are able to find near optimal policies. We can try to improve our policy over time. And basically what we do is we compare the Q values of discrete actions and pick the action which is optimal. Any questions so far to that? Seems not the case. Okay. Good. As the next step, what we are going to do is we transfer the second scheme, the least squares temporal difference, to least squares policy iteration. So. What is our assumption now is that we basically um, have uh, a batch situation. So what do I refer to a batch situation? So uh, we have a bunch of data which we have obtained from um, on-policy learning or even also from off-policy learning. And we utilize this bunch of data which is fixed or nearly fixed. And we will try to process the entire data batch in order to learn about Q values and then also improve these Q values over time by epsilon greedy learning in the context of generalized policy iteration. Uh, for the state values, we have introduced that last week uh, as LSTD, least squares temporal difference learning. And today I would like to extend that to the Q values, which is LS Zaza, or sometimes in the literature also called LSTD. Q, Q for Q values for obvious reasons. And what we basically will find is also that this transfer is quite straightforward. So what do we see here is that the target, here the target on the left hand side, is approximated again by our first order temporal difference learning approximation. So reward plus discounted successor state and action pair. And in order to be able to utilize the closed form least square solution, where we can utilize ordinary least squares or eventually recursive least squares in a closed form, is that the Q value function, the approximate function, is represented by this linear mapping. So feature space state, for example, using tile coding, as we have seen before, or very often what we will find are radial basis functions, for example. And we will multiply this feature space of the states times our parameter vector w, and therefore we'll have a linear function approximated. If we do so, we can again define our least squares cost function, and in this least squares cost function, Using the Zaza approach, we have the rewards as given information. These would be the so-called outputs uh, in the uh, yeah, least squares context. Here we have the state at time point k, the successor state at time point k plus y, which is discounted. This would be the regressor information, and then w as the only unknown quantity in this case. What we then do is, using the batch information, we will get a number of batch information, so a number of rewards, a number of state transitions or discounted state transitions, and this information can either come, as I said, from on-policy learning, or it can come from any arbitrary policy, uh, target policy, for example, in the sense of off-policy learning. So that is now a difference to the previous subsection. In the previous subsection, we have defined the cost function as the on-policy learning cost function. Because we needed to assume that the data samples which we uh, receive in order to calculate the gradient uh, as accurately as possible, that these data samples come from the on-policy behavior. Now with least squares or least squares policy iteration, we can also eventually get the information from other policies, so that is also applicable to off-policy problems. 
So therefore, we have the flexibility to collect training samples arbitrarily. And of course, if the training samples come from a different distribution, there might be some estimation bias, but we have already discussed that. If this data samples are then available in the context of the regressor matrix and the output target vector, what we can then again do, this is basically just the result from last week, again copy it here for the Q values, that is we can solve the least squares problem here in the least squares Zaza problem by simple linear algebra, right? So that's a, that is the beauty of this linear approach. Here in these regressor matrices, there's just a bunch of data here in the output vector, the target vector, there's also just a bunch of reward information. And the only thing in order to find the optimal parameters of our linear function approximator is very simple. We need to do a matrix um, transposition. We need to do one matrix matrix multiplication, one inverse calculation, and another matrix uh, multiplication and the matrix vector multiplication. So these are very simple, straightforward, numerically uncostly linear algebra operations, which are normally much computationally uh, cheaper, much cheaper than the gradient descent methods on artificial neural networks. We can then utilize this information either for on-policy prediction, if the actions come from uh, the same policy, or if the policy come from off-policy uh, policies, then that would be, of course, useful for control. Eventually, that is also something which we discussed also last week, that can get numerically unstable. Uh, for example, if the data here in the matrices are linear uh, dependent, then we can utilize regularization like rich regression, or we can also do recursive implementation for online learning if required. That, of course, now is the straightforward extension just to Q-value prediction, right? So here we just have some data from a data tuple in a data bank, data set. And from this data, we basically learn a function approximator in terms of approximating the Q-values. So that does not yet help us in order to find optimal control decisions. In order to do optimal in order to learn about optimal or near optimal control decisions, what we actually need to do is we need to apply again the generalized policy iteration scheme. So basically what we will do is that over time we can utilize new data which we re receive by updated policies using Epsilon Greedy for example or guided search using for example the Dyna framework in order to improve the policy by greedy choices. Therefore, from least squares Zaza to least squares policy iteration, we can find that this is an offline and off policy control approach because the data set using epsilon greedy is normally not the on policy set. And the exploration, of course, is required in order to change this data set D over time using epsilon greedy or random samples, for example, such that we can learn new things over time, right? So if you have different Decision options you need to try out all the different decision options and then find out which of them is actually the best. This is a concept of generalized policy iteration, which is now integrated here into this least squares approach. If we put that together in a simple algorithmic implementation, what do we need? We need a feature representation, so our feature engineering vector. We need a data set from our um, yeah, offline generated data. We might introduce an accuracy threshold if you're interested in some um, yeah, learning tracking. So if our learning process has come to an end, that we basically also end our learning algorithm. And we will initialize the weights of our linear function approximator more or less arbitrarily. And from this initialized parameter weights, we can then derive a policy, for example, by greedy choices based on Q. Then over time, what we will basically do is we will save these old weights for the sake of um, monitoring, utilize then LS Zarza in order to update W, and we will do then updated argmax function on the discrete 
space in order to find out which actions are now better than others. And if the difference between uh, W and W prime is basically very small, then we would indicate that as an information that the learning process has come to an end. In small discrete action spaces, of course, this argmax operation is very straightforward. As I said, if you have five different options, five discrete decisions, you just have to compare these five different action values against each other for every part of the state space. And that would then only mean that the action you take where the state action value is the highest. After a full evaluation of this cycle here, so after a uh, LSASA step and the ArcMax step, of course, what we would do is we would also like to change our data set D, right? So, because if the data set D is identical all the time, and maybe the data set D is not a comprehensive data set, in terms of a full description of our problem space, we might want to add new data to the data set D over time such that this learning process can be supported. And that could be then either done by, for example, epsilon greedy or random choices in general. If you'd like to see more information on this, um, I can also recommend you here this literature source, least class policy iteration, where the scheme was first introduced already 20 years back. With this least squares policy iteration, I would like to also give you a simple application example which is actually now the inverted pendulum. So this is more or less our mountain car problem, right? So we need to swing up something, but now we focus on the other part of the problem. We try not to swing up actually the, uh, the car or the pendulum rod, but in this application problem, what we're going to do is we try to stabilize this rod as close as possible to this upper equilibrium point. So what is happening is that this pendulum is initialized randomly in close proximity to the upper equilibrium position. So sometimes it will be maybe initialized in this way or a little bit in this way. And the agent, based on the linear uh, least squares policy iteration, should then learn how to apply discrete forces on this wagon and on this torque shaft such that the rod stays uh, upwards or as close as possible to upwards and there will be a negative penalty, so uh, a termination and a negative penalty actually if the agent fails and the rod flips over, right? So here is the horizontal line. If the pendulum is above the horizontal line, we do not get anything, which would be like a yeah, neutral reward. But if the rod goes below the horizontal line, there would be an episode termination and some negative penalty. If we do this with least squares policy iteration, then if we do this multiple times, for up to 3,000 learning steps, then we will get this learning curve from the same publication which I've already recommended to you previously. And this learning curve uh, basically incorporates some interesting information from my point of view. First of all, what we see is that this learning curve is capped by 3,000 steps. Why is that? If each episode has at maximum 3,000 steps and our objective is to stabilize the pendulum at the upper equilibrium position, that means if we are successful, the agent will reach this maximum number of episode steps, 3,000, and then the episode will terminate itself due to reaching the maximum number of steps. That would be the best case, right? If anything less, then 3,000 is achieved. That means that at some point of time, actually the pendulum flipped over and the agent did not achieve its best performance in this application example. So that's why we have basically this cap here at 3,000. And what is shown here is actually that 
not a single agent has been trained, but many agents have been trained independently from each other. And what we basically see from this table, or not from this table, from this figure, is a very large spread with respect to the agent performances in a set of different agents being independently trained on the problem. We see that some agents, or the best agent to be more precise, this pink line here, that this has already learned after maybe 50 episodes, I would say, uh, how to stabilize the pendulum every time until the 3,000 steps has been achieved. On the other hand, we also have the worst agent, which actually seems to learn nothing for the first four or 500 episodes. Um, of course, all these episodes would be then very small for obvious reasons, because it doesn't reach so many steps. And then after many episodes, it starts to actually learn something, how to stay alive longer. And eventually, if we would extend this axis here on the right-hand side, we would maybe also see that it climbs up again. However, this figure really indicates, especially here also with the mean and uh, the uh, box plots, or simplified box plots around this mean, around the set of agents, that this learning process is really uncertain and stochastic. Where does that come from? We have different degrees of uncertainty in our problem and in our solution. The first degree of uncertainty is that we initialize the rod position at the beginning of an episode arbitrarily. So that will have random, random impacts on the learning of the agent per training run. Secondly, when we try to explore something using epsilon greedy or random exploration in general, this randomness can be different for different realizations of the training for different agents. So there's a second degree of randomness. And last but not least, if we initialize our parameter vector for the Q value approximator also randomly at the beginning of the um, learning process, that is a third random impact. And we see from these three random impacts that given this application example, this can have like really big influences from a very bad performance in terms of learning and a very good performance in terms of learning. And that is actually uh, a difference also to the tabular methods. Uh, of course, in the tabular methods, we also had random impacts. So we had also random actions which needs to be picked due to exploration reasons. But normally, the spread between best performing and lowest performing agents and tabular methods have been much less significant than here in this example for a deep learning, or at least approximate learning uh, agent. And uh, this is definitely also something which we need to consider in terms of practical implementations and practical examples. Because if you train an agent once, you do not know where your single agent is located in this set of learning curves. Maybe you have been unlucky and the single agent you have learned is a very bad one. Maybe you have been lucky and your agent you have trained has been very good, but you do not know if you actually train one agent, right? So in order to evaluate the performance of your algorithm in the application, you would need to actually train many, many, many agents in order to evaluate statistical distributions of the learning curve and the final performance of the learning um, outcome to validate how good or how bad the method is you apply to the application, right? So therefore, single shots in the training are not sufficient. We need to find data from the training from evaluation, which is richer, which is based on more samples than just a single agent. And this observation from this figure here is definitely also a general observation, which does not only apply to linear uh, least squares policy iteration, but to all function approximator based policy making decisions. So we definitely need to evaluate the performance of our agents, not based on a single training, 
but based on multiple trainings such that we can get accurate or as accurate as possible estimates of the mean and the standard deviation, for example, of the performance of this agent configuration in a given application, because in every reinforcement learning solution and potentially also in every environment which we operate with, there are random impacts and these random impacts can significantly change and impact the performance of a single agent in contrast to a set of agents. Okay, so very important takeaway message. Um, if you just train an agent once, you do not know if that is lucky or an unlucky shot. As an extension, um, I would like also to propose here the online least squares policy iteration. That is also actually nothing new. What we have introduced last week was the recursive least squares temporal difference learning algorithm where we used recursive least squares uh, to get rid of this inverse here because calculating the inverse of a matrix can be quite sloppy, it can be quite computationally expensive, especially when it comes to embedded implementation using cost-sensitive hardware. Therefore, what I just propose here for sake of completeness is the transfer from recursive least squares temporal difference learning recursive least squares Zaza, where the updates of the parameter vector, so basically this part here, is done again on the recursive least squares algorithm, which uh, does not need to take into account the matrix inverse, but which basically calculates the matrix inverse in a recursive fashion using recursive least squares. So therefore, the Recursive least squares TD algorithm can be also extended here to the Q values and therefore to control. However, if we have a look at this algorithm in more detail, uh, we can see that this algorithm basically has have multiple hyperparameters. One hyperparameter here is again this forgetting factor lambda. So what was this forgetting factor lambda? The forgetting factor lambda takes place here and here. So this lambda basically tells us how much of the data we have seen in the past do we forget over time. So if you have data which you have seen, let's say, many, many steps in the past, this data might be not representative anymore for your agent because your agent has developed over time using epsilon greedy. So it might be useful to get rid of this information by forgetting it and this will be basically done by increasing the uncertainty of past samples using this forgetting factor lambda. So the first tuning parameter. The second tuning parameter you already know from many lectures, that's the epsilon greedy parameter, which is important here at this point. So this basically tells us just with which probability we will not take a greedy action, but a random different action in order to explore over time. Right, so this is another hyperparameter which we need to tune accordingly in order to find good learning performance. And another hyperparameter which I've added here, and this hyperparameter I have called KW. KW comes into action at this point of the pseudocode, and KW is basically just a counting variable which tells us that not every step, but every KW step we will actually do an update of our policy. Why is that? If we update our policy, right, so your decision-making process has changed, right? So that's making an update on our policy. You do not prefer anymore, anymore to go to McDonald's as your favorite restaurant, but you go to Burger King, right? So you have changed your policy. If you have changed your policy, maybe your Q values are not accurate anymore because in the past you went 100 times to McDonald's so you maybe have a very good you know, experience basis on how good or how bad the food at McDonald's is but now suddenly you go to for random exploration reasons to Burger King and your Q value of Burger King might be inaccurate. So based on that you do not want to change your policy maybe again soon because maybe your experience basis with Burger King is very few and you do not want to switch back to McDonald's because you're still somehow uncertain about your evaluation of Burger King. 
So therefore, this kw iteration parameter is here that will basically tell you that do not update your policy every time step you update your q-value estimate, but let your q-value estimate update itself a couple of times. Let's get additional experience that learn about the q-values of your new policy from the last policy update. And then eventually, when you are sure about the q-values of your new policy, then evaluate if there might be another opportunity for a policy update by epsilon greedy choices. So that is this motivation of this parameter kw. And this is actually a concept which we will see very often in reinforcement learning problems. So here it is introduced in this yeah, uh, online LSPI approach. But actually, we will see this a lot. And I think it's very intuitive, right? So if you change your policy and you do things, or your agent does things, which, which he or she didn't do in the, in the past so often, you lack experience about these new opportunities. And you first need to get new experience in order to be really sure what is good or bad. And this is actually modeled by this approach. Yeah. So. These things I have already discussed here, so uh, these remarks here on online LSPI, basically, and everything like that, uh, I have updated on the last slide or discussed already with you on the last slide. The only new information on this slide is basically if you're interested in more information about the online LSPI with recursive least squares implementation or something close to recursive least squares implementation, I can recommend you this paper. OK, so what have we done? We have transferred our batch idea from last week for batch learning of prediction now to batch learning of Q values and control. And before we basically proceed to the deep Q networks, my question would be, do you have any questions before we proceed? No, not good. OK. What we are going now to do is in the last 25 minutes is to take some time in order to discuss a very well-known and very often used algorithm. So this DKN algorithm in terms of true deep reinforcement learning is actually an algorithm class or a basic algorithm from which many algorithm variants are derived, which is really, uh, I would call it like an all-time favorite of practitioners in the reinforcement learning context. So therefore, uh, it is very useful in the everyday practice. Uh, and it also comes with uh, a combination. So it basically combines many ideas which we had previously together, adds some tweaks to it in order to generate design a learning algorithm which is very data efficient and robust. So where does the deep Q learning network idea comes from, DQN? It basically comes from, yeah, Q learning, right? So we had Q learning in the tabular methods. And Q learning was that idea that, OK, um, Let's do not do two, two steps after each other. So let's do not learn about the Q values and then try to uh, find the best optimal decisions by a one step prediction, but basically try to make both in one step by adding this max operator here to this TD target in order to learn not only about all Q values of all my decision options, but directly find to learn the optimal Q values. Right? So that was basically the, the basic idea behind tabular Q learning. And deep Q learning or deep Q networks basically try, that is now in an abstracted form, we will modify this later on, but we'll, we will basically see that deep Q networks will try to transfer this idea which we had here in tabular methods, which was very data efficient and straightforward, to the approximate case where the Q value is not a tabular information with discrete cells, 
but is a function described over the state space and the discrete actions by some parameter w. So basically also there, a direct transfer from incremental learning of tabular q methods to deep learning q methods. However, we will see that we will actually not really utilize this kind of uh, learning step. We will see that we will uh, utilize a little bit different cost function and solution to that later on, and that we will also actually add additional tricks to our toolbox in order to have a very uh, robust learning process. What are our tricks which we add to the toolbox? We will also discuss them in more detail a little bit later. The first trick is that we will use replay buffers. This replay buffer is this data set D, which we have seen in the previous subsection and also last week. So in this context of least squares temporal difference learning or least square SASA, that we assume we have data from the past and we store it for some time, right? So we do not take a data sample, learn from it and throw it away, but we take this data sample, we neatly put it into a data bank and let it sit there for some time and therefore we are able to reutilize this data two, three, four times over time in the so-called experience replay buffer. So therefore what we do as a first trick is that what we have seen in this linear function approximator methods, the data batch approach, that we will also apply this now to a deep learning method using artificial neural networks. First trick. And second trick, which I will discuss later on in more details, this is more like for notation, what we are going to do is we will introduce a so-called target network. This target network, which I indicate here by W minus or W dash, is a clone of my actual Q learning network. And we will utilize this clone network for bootstrapping the target. So for basically bootstrapping here the max operator out of it. We will see later on why this is useful. Uh, just for notation purpose, I basically mentioned it already here. So W minus is a cloned version of our Q value estimator, which we will call the so-called target network. The motivation behind these two steps is as follows. For the replay buffer, of course, we want to reutilize available data as much as possible. That is the experience replay buffer. And the motivation behind this bootstrapped target network is actually coming from supervised machine learning. Right, we have discussed if I plug in here in my target, this would be my target of the DQN, if I plug in my actual um, Q value function approximator here, that this gradient or this gradient times this brackets will basically depend on the parameters W here itself, which I would like to update over time. And if I put in here a cloned version of my um, Q value estimate, which I also normally do clone and freeze it for some time, that this will basically lead to a more robust learning because it will basically decouple the target estimate from the learning estimates here on the right hand side. Yeah. Yes, so that is a very good question. For this, I just go back to my discussion of this one. Uh, we can actually decide this. So this will become a hyperparameter, um, for example, with this KW in the LSPI context. So in the simplified or in the simple case, what we will do is we will clone the parameters of our original Q estimator and the target Q estimator just every now and then. So maybe every 10 steps or every 100 steps, then we will do a cloning, so an update, and then freeze the target networks for some time. Right? So this is basically also done here. It's freeze everything for some time and then do an update, and that can be then also done for the target networks. Um, an alternative approach, which is not sketched here on the slide, would be something like an incremental update. That we say, okay, if using Q-learning, 
these weights w are changed over time. Let's add something like a low pass filter from w to w minus such that changes in w are slowly and in a delayed form transferred to w minus, but not in discrete steps that we say every hundred step we do like a complete transfer, but we do it like 1% at a time, right? So we update 1% of the change every time. That would be then something like a low pass filter kind of approach, which you might uh, hopefully remember from signal theory or system theory. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So this alpha would be the learning in terms of the actual Q uh, learning um, network. Uh, of course, this incremental approach in terms of a low pass filter from W to W minus would be more or less an identical approach, but then we would have a second hyperparameter for that, right? Okay. So let's summarize what we have discussed so far the working principle of DQN. So we will have a big or potentially big network which is used in order to take actions. These actions can be then also improved over time, for example, using epsilon greedy. By applying these actions to our environment, we get observed tuples of state, next states, actions, and rewards. And as we are using an experience replay buffer, a tuple which we receive from a single state transition, so from a single action applied, and observing the reaction of the plant, that this data is stored into our experience replay buffer, or sometimes just called memory buffer. The target, here the target, is calculated using the parameter vector W minus, the target network, which is a delayed version of our actual parameters, either by delaying a certain number of steps or by uh, incremental change over time. And another difference now is now that with the target network, so here with our target on the left-hand side, this parenthesis is here the expression from here, so this would be the target network information, that using this information that we try to find out how to parameterize, how to learn this Q value approximator, that we will basically put this into a quadratic cost function, giving some mini batch data from our memory buffer D, and this cost function here is now a generalized cost function in the sense of a supervised machine learning step, right? So we have a target using bootstrapping and using this target networks. So everything which is here in this parenthesis expression is so to call fixed, right? So this is information which we can calculate in a learning step beforehand. We have the target network, which is a cloned version of our actual Q-value network, so that, that is a fixed function. We have rewards, states, or successor states and actions from our data buffer, from which we draw mini-batches. And therefore, this information here in the parenthesis is fixed information. And as this is truly fixed information for a learning step, and we want to learn about how to update our function approximator here on the right-hand side, we can plug in this cost function into any supervised machine learning optimizer. So therefore, we are not limited anymore to the simple gradient descent learning steps, like original gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, but we can also utilize higher level, higher, more sophisticated, supervised machine learning solvers. For those which are familiar of you with supervised machine learning, this would be then, for example, classically solved by gradient descent solvers, including momentum, that is the famous ADAM optimizer, 
you maybe have heard from TensorFlow, PyTorch or other toolboxes, which is normally more stable and quicker in terms of convergence than standard stochastic gradient descent solvers. You could also, we had this discussion previously, um, try to optimize this um, using non-gradient descent solvers, right? So this is fixed information, this is my function which I want to optimize. So I could try to optimize this cost function using global optimization techniques from genetic algorithms over particle swarm optimization, Bayesian optimization, and whatsoever, because this is a yeah, very simple optimization task, and we do not need to limit ourselves to gradients anymore. So therefore, although I have introduced deep Q learning based on this incremental learning step from Q learning for tabular methods, we have now reached a point using this trick of target networks that we can define a cost function which is also applicable to non-incremental learning by genetic algorithms, gradient descent, and so on. However, in practice, uh, using standard machine learning algorithms, normally you will do some gradient descent based optimization due to implementation and numerical reasons like ADAM optimization for, and so on. Yeah, W minus is based on W and updated from time to time. We already had that. Okay, if we summarize this um, slide in a figure, that would be the figure. Uh, I would draw from that. What do we see here? On the right hand side is our classical reinforcement learning loop. Agent applies actions, receives states, rewards, and observations. And this information, these tuples, are stored in our experience replay buffer, in our memory buffer. From this memory buffer, we can draw mini batches. So, for example, this memory buffer can hold ten thousands or hundred thousands of past experience tuples, and maybe we just draw mini batches, 64 data samples, 128 data samples, so a very small batch in order to process this via a CPU or larger mini batches if we want to process this via a GPU, but there's a question. Yes. Okay, that's a good question. How do we draw actually the mini batches from the from the memory buffer? The answer to this normally is that we just draw it randomly, right? So we have the entire batch and we draw randomly samples from it. So that doesn't mean that the newest sample which is sent into the memory buffer is actually drawn in the next iteration of the DQN. It will be drawn at some point by depending on how many batches you draw over time but there is no guarantee that it will be drawn in the first attempt when it is new. Yeah, there is some argument for that, absolutely. Um, however, normally these parameters here, so our DQN network parameters W, if we are using a standard supervised machine learning solver like ADAM, so stochastic gradient descent with momentum, um, normally these parameters W, they do not change erratically. Normally, if you look at the, if you take single parameters out of this, of this network, of this cartoonic network, what you will actually find, let's say this is number of sample, uh, time steps k, and this is some parameter wi, you will find that these parameters, they will change quite smoothly over time due to the usage of stochastic gradient descent solvers with smoothing momentum filters, I would call them. And therefore, the change of w over time is normally quite slow, let's say, and continuous over time, and therefore it is not really so important 
that if you are at this point in time where a new data sample is put into the memory buffer, that you actually really need to process this right away because the parameter will not change so dramatically over time. There's another question. <laughs> Yeah, the generalization topic is definitely a topic which needs to be addressed in that sense that you need to ensure that in average, in expectation, that inside the memory buffer, we will have a good distribution of state and actions with respect to your problem space, right? So you need to ensure by exploration strategies, they're not shown here in the figure, unfortunately, that can be done either by Ex, uh, epsilon greedy sampling or by scheduled exploration that you really observe states and actions from the entire problem space where your agent should operate, right? So if you have a bias in your data, and let's say your data is just stretching over a very small part of the problem space, then of course in the small part of the problem space the agent will likely learn to perform very well but then, for whatsoever reason, the agent is put into another part of the problem space where it didn't obtain experience previously, the performance is very likely to be poor, right? If the generalization was already lost conceptually at that point where we introduce approximation using functions, right? Uh, on top of this problem that we are using function approximators, we now technically need to ensure that this data set or the expectation over the data set distribution is representative for our problem space, right? So let's say your agent is a, I don't know, an autopilot for an airplane, and inside this memory buffer you only find information about how to fly the airplane during cruise, so in normal speed mode at high altitude, and then eventually your autopilot agent needs to land this airplane and there is no experience in the replay buffer how to land an airplane, God bless you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Welcome to the world of reinforcement learning. <laughs> In reinforcement learning, sometimes pain is part of the learning process, <laughs> right? So um, if you would be the agent, right, you will also have some delay, right? So you will sense a fire and then it will take some time until you have eventually processed this information and take back your hand. This delay in terms of what you would do as a human would be then the delay until the data is eventually fully processed by the agent, right? Yes, in expectation, in expectation, right? And um, you, as a software designer of this algorithm, then of course needs to ensure that this is actually true, right? Um, so what, yeah, we will discuss that also in the very last lecture, to be honest, because then we will discuss about real world implementation details, especially also of this algorithm um, in our lab, actually. And, um, but let's assume the following. Let's assume after one iteration in the environment, you will do a full iteration of this learning cycle, right? So what will happen is you will have one data sample which is added to your memory, right? And as I said, you draw a mini batch. And typical mini batches, if you do it on CPU, 64, 128 data points are sampled, so that means Per single data point, which is added to the memory buffer, you draw 6,428 samples out of the memory buffer. So that means in expectation, this new data snippet would be called 6,428 times before it will be discarded somewhere in the future, right? So in expectation, 
if we assume that these two loops are executed synchronously and identically often, you would see this data sample as often as the size of this mini batch. Clear so far? No? Almost? Right, so um, let's say you have uh, a memory buffer just, you know, with 10 memory cells, right? Um, and let's say you have uh, a ring buffer. So the size is fixed, 10. Um, if now a new memory element comes into the buffer, the oldest one will be kicked out, right? The, the tenth oldest one out and the new one in. And now your mini batch, let's say it's two. So from this 10, you draw two out of the memory buffer. You will process it, update your policy, and a new iteration will begin. In this new iteration, a new data sample will be sent to the memory buffer, but your previous data sample, which you have added to the buffer, is still a very young buffer element, right? So it will be still in the buffer and the next oldest one will be kicked out. And again, two will be drawn and so on, right? So one in, two drawn, one in, two drawn. If you do this so often until your newest data sample has become the oldest one, then actually it should have been drawn in expectation two times, right? Maybe not directly, but at some time it will be, right? Darius, I think you also had a question. Yes, so takeaway message, the standard algorithm implementation is actually random drawing. So if you look into all the standard reinforcement learning toolboxes, which are available uh, as open source software, they all normally draw random mini batches. But as Dario said, there are many methods in order to make that more sophisticated. But for the moment in this basic lecture, we just assume it is randomly drawn. Right? Because that is also easy to implement because you just need random, random number generator which basically tells you draw sample 1, 7, and 8. Right? Okay. The pseudocode um, of the DQM, uh, let's just briefly go through it. So what do we do? We just need one function, the Q value function, which includes possible the feature engineering, 
for the Q values, for example, with this multi-head architecture, which we have introduced at the beginning. We need the epsilon greedy parameter for exploration. And here again, I introduced this update factor KW, which is used to update the um, policy every now and then. The weights are arbitrarily initialized and we need a memory buffer with a certain capacity. So this could be this ring buffer, that if this ring buffer is full eventually, that you then disregard the oldest samples and adding the newest samples to the ring buffer instead. So then over time, we take actions using our function approximator with epsilon greedy choices for exploration purpose. We observe the plant response, we put the response of the plant into the buffer, we draw mini batches from the buffer, and then with the mini batch information, we calculate the target information using the target network as this delayed network, and then with this target information, which is now fixed information in that sense of this quadratic loss function, we can fit the function approximator on this target information using any standard machine learning optimizer. And then eventually, if this update uh, here is reached, we will basically clone the weights of our Q network with the target networks. Uh, and this is, as we already discussed, is just a simple implementation, right? We can do this incrementally, and this would be the vanilla cloning in a full batch. Okay, uh, what is summarized here is really the, the vanilla DQN implementation, uh, like from the lecture books, basically, um, as you would do it in the standard variant. We will see uh, in three weeks from now and also in four weeks from now that there are many variations, many possibilities how to extend this algorithm. And therefore, it is so important here to understand the concept of this basic algorithm. This is not the perfect algorithm for sure, but it is a basic class of algorithm which is used then as a ground truth or ground basis for many more sophisticated algorithms which are improved with respect to sampling of the experience replay buffer or which might have better updates here of the target weights and so on, right? So therefore, very good to know this algorithm. Where does the algorithm actually come from? Uh, of course, I also want you to give you the uh, resource here. That's uh, from Min and others, human level control through deep reinforcement learning. That is actually one of the yeah, great breakthroughs of reinforcement learning in the domain where it really gained momentum. Um, maybe I just jump over this with respect to time. It's not so important here. But uh, I just want to give you a small application example at the end of today, which is uh, basically um, from this breakthrough paper, which I've mentioned previously. And that is where the DQN, the DeepQ learning network has been applied to Atari games. And the deep part here refers to the fact that the guys at um, uh, Google basically did the following. They took an Atari simulator, which directly put it out pixel pictures, so basically an emulation of the Atari display, which was 84 times 84 pixels. And they basically stacked four images over each other from the last four frames over time, so that they basically had an information about if you have like any, I don't know, item or any entity which is moving in this image that you can have an information about the dynamics over time. So that's why they stacked four pictures over each other. And then using convolutional neural networks, basically, they directly process the information graphically and then evaluated here at the output of this DQN layer, which of the actions is best. Uh, here we have actually 18 possible actions as a combination of joystick positions and actions in the Atari, right? So you can go, I think, up, down, right, left. Then you have two action buttons, and I think also in the corners or something, so in total 18 actions with Atari. Uh, and basically this output layer have been then the Q values for these 18 different actions as a combination of joystick and button positions or button actions of the Atari console. And then that 
would basically mean that here at the output, you would have 18 outputs for the 18 actions. And at every point of time, you just compare these different 18 Q values with each other and take this joystick and button combination in the Atari console, which gives you the greatest uh, reward or the greatest Q value to be precise. There's also a very nice uh, YouTube video as an interview or lecture from uh, Vladislav Min, which uh, introduced this uh, recent, uh, not recently, but in 2015, of course, uh, which I find very informative. The breakthrough of this paper was in basically due to the fact that in many games, so here on this x-axis, we can basically see the game names of many Atari games, that all the games which are shown here on the left-hand side, that this reinforcement learning algorithm was able to beat the best possible human performance. And that was really a breakthrough uh, in that sense that it could have could been shown that for a large set of games, an artificial intelligence based algorithm was able to outperform a human. And that's really one of the big uh, breakthroughs of reinforcement learning which has been then uh, also applied to other games and engineering and so on, natural sciences and so on. But this was really the breakthrough where the DQN algorithm was introduced in this form as we have introduced it today and performed very well. Okay. That was just a very small application example. We will see um, in the last lecture of our series that we can also use the DQN for engineering applications. So this is of course a fun application here with Atari as a, as a uh, yeah, non-engineering kind of problem, but we will also see that this DQN approach can be actually really useful for real-world control of intelligent technical systems. Any questions before we conclude for today? Yes. The exam, the exam will be an oral exam and you just request an appointment with me. <laughs> so you propose a date and then it will happen if I am available. Yes, there's another question. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I mean, at the beginning, if you have no pre-experience, right, of the problem you are interacting with, the environment you're interacting with, I mean, if you do not know what to do, you just do random stuff, right? If you do not know how to, I don't know, right, do something, you just do random actions. And this is off-policy learning, right? So from random actions, you can actually learn already something. Yeah, sure, but they, not only the targets are wrong, but also the actual Q-value estimates are also wrong at the beginning, right? Because your algorithm has been initialized arbitrarily. So this is very inaccurate, this is very inaccurate. And of course, if you have no pre-knowledge, if you start from scratch, if you start from nothing, that's where you start. You just start with very bad Q-values. And this then applies to both of these networks. That's the part where you need to go through. Um, however, the question is very good in that sense that it motivates um, why this is problematic in terms of real-world implementation. So let's think again of a real-world implementation. So let's think that this environment is again our airplane where you need to land the airplane safely on ground. If you do not have any experience in your experience buffer, which represents how to do this landing maneuver, then of course you will crash. Your agent will fail. And if you really consider on an airplane or other technical systems, this is not acceptable. You cannot learn how to land an airplane by crashing it 10 times. So therefore, um, this question really leads us also to the motivation why it is important to also, in terms of engineering at least, to add pre-knowledge 
and additional methods which allow you to pre-train or to evaluate unsecure actions at this point of the algorithm to ensure that a learning agent and learning software does not do something which will harm your actual physical system, right? Like crashing the airplane on the ground. And if you use this vanilla kind of reinforcement learning, this is not just limited to DQN, it can be also, the argument is more or less the same to any learning system where random actions and uncertain actions are taken into account, that this is safety critical and basically motivates in engineering that we need to add up additional safety enforcing methods, which are then coming from control engineering, which are coming from system theory and so on, right? So that's why this algorithm had its breakthrough in games and not in autonomous driving. Because there was uh, a lot of work in between applying this algorithm to games in a software simulator and then using similar algorithms nowadays in autonomous driving. Other questions? That would be academically, of course, an interesting approach that we change targets along the way. Yeah, why not? Um, technically, so Monte Carlo means that the episode has to be terminated, right? Yeah, sure. That, I mean, in terms of preciseness, we have normally from NSTEP CD or NSTEP Zaza, we will find that Given an application, there's a sweet spot about how many samples should I take, and then I do the bootstrapping, right? Um, but if we really consider this initial learning phase, you do not know nothing about the system. You do not know nothing about your decision-making process. Same problem. You will fail at some point. For Monte Carlo, actually, your episode needs to be terminated, right? So uh, airplane landing means the bird needs to go down in some or the other direction. Um, and yeah, if you do not have any pre-knowledge, you will basically just fail with it, right? So what you have mentioned is an interesting concept to, you know, blend in different um, targets. Um, we have introduced this actually also previously. We have called this these compound targets, right? Where we had basically different end step targets and said, okay, let's try to average them together. So maybe we take like TD0 with a TD3 and TD10 and we weight them like one over three, one over three, one over three, and we build something like an ensemble target, right? That can help in order to uh, squeeze out the maximum of accuracy, the, the squeeze out the maximum of information out of our learning process. But this can help you in order to get the learning curve, you know, steeper and maybe also to reach higher values at the end in terms of performance. But this will not help at the beginning where you do not know nothing about the system. Okay, then, uh, sorry for the extra time. Um, we close the lecture here for today and then Darius will go with you through the exercise in you know, 15, 20 minutes <laughs> as usual and then we see us next week. Thanks. <laughs>